Um, in, the, in the insurance industry, um, the primary application of predictive modeling is in estimating the cost of the product that they sell. So we're trying to identify what rate do we charge each individual policyholder for auto insurance. Uh, do we vary the rate based on age, gender, marital status, all those different factors. Um, that's the primary application, and it's the one that's probably uh, been used the most in the insurance industry. There are secondary applications. Companies are evaluating uh, policyholder retention, so for uh, renewals, when they send out a renewal notice, uh, they will track to see whether or not uh, their policyholder renews. Um, and with new business, they'll look at what we call conversion modeling, <clears throat> which will be the probability that a prospective policyholder will uh, purchase the policy, a new, a new policyholder. Um, price optimization sort of takes all this stuff together, both retention modeling, conversion modeling, and estimating the price, and tries to identify uh, what is the optimal price to charge based on both sort of the supply and the demand side of the equation. Um, in insurance also, there's uh, predictive modeling can be used to detect fraud. I think uh, Luis Francis is going to be talking about that, or she actually did talk about it already. And um, marketing, traditional marketing uh, applications that you see in just about any industry um, are used in the insurance industry as well. When we are estimating the cost of insurance, and that's what I'm going to focus on for just a moment here, um, the goal is to develop a unique rate for every risk. So we're not trying to identify, uh, if you think about sort of a, uh, a typical uh, mass mail marketing study where you're just trying to find out who is, going to re who is actually going to respond to my, to my mail. Uh, in this case, I want to have a rate for every single risk. So there's no such thing as a good and a bad risk. If, it, if, ever, if the rate is priced properly, everybody's a good risk to an insurance company. It's an important thing to think about because um, conceptually for many years, insurance companies thought about this concept of good versus bad risk. And in personal auto insurance, uh, what we found was that uh, everybody was competing over the same policyholders. Everybody wanted to write and insure the 40-year-old uh, married male and female with 2.5 kids driving a minivan. So naturally, competition drove the profit margins to nothing in that particular business. It was called the preferred business. No accidents on the record um, and uh, good policyholder. Uh, but the non-standard auto business, the people that rode motorcycles or the people that were 16 years old or maybe had a, a couple accidents on their record, um, there were a number, a number of companies that said, you know what, that's a good market. And if, it's, if we can develop the right price for it, we can uh, make a lot of money. And so if you, uh, you probably, for those of you that are not familiar in the insurance industry, if you've seen commercials about Geico and Progressive, that's how they became big. They became big because they went after the non-standard auto market and made a killing. And they quickly became one of the top five auto industry uh, companies in the, in the uh, country by doing that. Um, when you are actually developing a unique rate for every single risk, you quickly exhaust the data because you are really um, exploring all the combinations as opposed to just separating out good versus bad or yes versus no. Um, when I, I'm showing a picture here of a, of a typical gains curve when you're looking at loss costs for insurance and um, you can see it's a very smooth line. We don't, have, um, we don't have a situation where the graph goes up real steep and then you get a lot of lift and then uh, the model sort of flattens out after a certain point. What you tend to find is a very shallow curve on a gains curve. Um, another thing to, to point out is that the risks are described by the predictor variables, not the target. So um, what we need to have is a mapping of the predictor variables. What makes up a, if we talk about personal auto insurance, what makes up an auto insurance uh, policy or a risk? What are the characteristics? And uh, we need to be able to map those to the target value and not the other way around. So um, if you can think about it, uh, we're taking a set of data, our existing policyholders, and we're evaluating their experience. But what we want to do is not necessarily determine the price for those policyholders that we have today, but also policyholders that we may have tomorrow, which may be a different combination of the characteristics that we have today. You take, for example, a, a typical insurance premium example here. Uh, 
I have a real simple example where the premium is simply, uh, and this is how a lot of rate filings are shown with insurance companies. Uh, a premium is just uh, the base premium times policyholder age times rating area in this simple example, where the base rate might be $1,000. And then we have a table of relativities set up in a multiplicative fashion in this case, where a youthful operator in rating area C would just be the base rate times youthful relativity 1.7 times rating area C 1.15. Um, and again, we could have a data set that doesn't even have that particular uh, observation in it, but we can still create it from our rating manuals or our rating tables um, this way. Insurance is highly regulated. Um, there are lots of restrictions on what you can and cannot do. Um, sometimes the exercise is not just to find out what the right rate is, but what was the right rate that we can actually uh, file that, that the regulators will approve. So um, every state is different, and uh, you'll find all different types of rules and stuff, but they were, there will be rules about which predictors you can and cannot use. Um, in a lot of states, like California, you can't use credit score in personal auto. Um, there are rules on the values of predictors. They might have a rule that says people over age uh, 65 can't have a relativity or a rate that's more than 10% higher than an age 40 to 60 person, year old uh, just for the age component. Um, uh, a, lot of, a lot of states have rules about the maximum rate change between adjacent territories. You can't have maybe more than a 5% or 10% increase moving from maybe downtown San Diego to suburban San Diego like La Jolla or somewhere. Uh, and then in uh, some places, some, some jurisdictions will even have rules on the predictor order and magnitude of importance. So for example, in California, which is really an oddball state, um, they have what they call sequential analysis, which requires driving record to be the paramount uh, order of magnitude on your rate. And then uh, annual mileage has to be the next, uh, followed by years held license. And so um, you have to sort of devise a strategy that, that meets these requirements. Um, the other thing about the regulated marketplace is that um, rates need to be supported. Oftentimes, you'll find that insurance companies, when they file the rates with the regulator, there's a public hearing. And you get all kinds of uh, people uh, contesting what, what uh, sort of uh, results you have. So, uh, the, the point made there is that a black, a black box methodology just won't be accepted. You can't just say, hey, I've got the best model I know I do because I've got a, a, a few statistics here and I slammed it through and I got something. They're going to want to see evidence. They're going to want to see ex explanations. Um, and you're going to have to show that. Typical response variables are continuous. So uh, in the example of uh, modeling loss costs, we're looking at... Um, we're looking at a, a cost which we uh, might call, in the insurance industry, we call a pure premium. It represents the, the portion of the premium that you pay that covers the losses. There are other portions of the premium that you pay for taxes, profit, expense loads, commissions, and other things. But the pure part of the premium, which is the part that covers actual the indemnification of the injured party, is uh, what we tend to model. And um, unlike a lot of other in, uh, industries, we have a lot of data. Uh, relative to that. Um, I think I was, I was the very first session I was in with uh, Jerry Friedman, he was talking about data sets with uh, 500 observations and 10,000 predictor variables. Um, we're, we are certainly in, in the insurance industry the exact opposite of that. We have, you know, you might have a million observations and you might be looking at maybe a hundred um, predictor variables or something. Uh, we do tend to look at cost in terms of frequency and severity. Um, for those of you that drive, you know that um, hopefully you haven't gotten in many accidents. And so what you tend to find is that maybe accident frequency in personal auto insurance might be something like, let's say it's 5%. That means only 5% of your records are going to actually have a loss. Uh, the other 95% are going to show zero. You're going to show basically no loss. There was, you know, do, do we charge that policyholder nothing? Absolutely not. But uh, because of the, uh, the nature that there's a very low frequency, and also, when there is an accident, it can tend to be very expensive. Um, so we have a high severity. Uh, we tend to model, to build models that develop sort of predictors on frequency and severity separately, and then combine them at the end. 